The brother can't save the world with his feet on the ground. Sorry. Y'all, this is Todd Foolery, and this week, we gonna pretend the year is 1998. While Will Smith was getting jiggy with it, Monica and Brandy were arguing over who the boy belonged to, and Lauryn Hill released one of the most iconic albums of all time, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, black representation in kids' television was skyrocketing on Nickelodeon, <laughs> with shows like My Brother and Me, Gullah Gullah Island, Kenan and Kel, and Cousin Skeeter proving successful, Disney realized they needed to get in on this action and do what they do best, monopolize the market. <laughs> so in 1998, Disney Channel launched Zoob Disney, a programming block hosted by anthropomorphic robot or alien hybrid characters called Zoogs. This weekend afternoon and evening lineup was comprised of original and acquired shows targeted towards preteens and teenagers and made history by producing Disney's first black-led television series. So today I'll be covering that show's history, who created it, when the idea came to him, and why he left production after only a single season. I'll also discuss the show's structure, its impact on black culture, and where the actors are today. Now, when I say my brother and me shaped my adolescence, this show here shaped my preteen years. So let's just dive right on in and start talking about Silverstone. AKA the famous Jet Jackson. Before we get started, thank you so much for watching. I release new videos when I do, so if you enjoy revisiting television of decades past, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and notification bell this video to see more like it. Quick shout out to Marky Slaughter for suggesting this show, and if you, the viewer, have any obscure or underrated 90s television you'd like me to cover, comment it down below. If it meets my criteria and I can actually find episodes, I'll watch, research, review, and retrospect it. Now, let's start talking about this show. That's me. I mean, I play Jet Jackson, a 13 year old television star who plays a middle school private investigator on a hit series. Yes, you are money. You with me so far? The famous Jet Jackson is about the lead of a teen action television show moving from Los Angeles back home to a small town in North Carolina called Willstead. He lives there with his father, Sheriff Woodrick, or Wood Jackson, and great-grandmother, Ms. Coretta, while his actress mother, Jules Jackson, remains in LA but visits periodically until she moves back permanently in season three. While the series does feature storylines from Jet's show Silverstone, it's actually about Jet just trying to be a kid, live a relatively normal life, and spend time with his two best friends, J.B. Halliburton and Kayla West. It also centers around reoccurring characters like Cubby, the special effects guy on Jet's show, and Booker Murray, Wood's bumbling but somewhat competent deputy. Then Nigel and Riley also get introduced in season two, but we'll discuss them later. The show premiered October 25th, 1998, and ran for three seasons with a total of 65 episodes, airing the finale June 22nd, 2001. The show even had a Disney Channel original movie debut June 8th, the same year that it ended. And while the show flashed forward, and we'll revisit that one eventually, is credited as the first Disney Channel original series, Jet Jackson is the first to have a black lead and be turned into a Disney Channel original movie, so there's some trivia you can tell friends at parties. Now, the show was created by Fercaswell Hyman, an actor, screenwriter, producer, and author that I was fortunate enough to interview for this video. He worked on shows like Ghost Rider, Gullah Gullah Island, and 101 Dalmatians the series before pitching the famous Jet Jackson to executives at Disney, and interestingly enough, he came up with the show's concept through his work on Ghost Rider. One day when visiting his mother in a tiny North Carolina town, Hyman wondered what it'd be like if Sheldon Turnipseed, the actor that played Jamal Jenkins on Ghost Rider, moved to a small town after becoming famous, and the rest is history. Disney loved the pitch, greenlit a pilot, which was filmed on the Universal Studios lot in Hollywood, then moved everything to Canada once the show was picked up for a full season, because money. 
Now, the famous Jed Jackson went through significant changes in tone, style, and storytelling throughout the course of the series. So, I'll be taking it season by season because the show we start with isn't necessarily the same we end with. But this series was received well by critics and audiences alike, features some major guest stars at the time, and even held early appearances for some very well-known actors today. So join me as I discuss all of that and let's journey through the show's evolution and cultural significance over the years. I'm just an actor. I'm not Silverstone. Oh, I've seen that crazy show of yours. And Silverstone may have all kinds of gadgets and tricks, but deep down, it's you I'm watching. Okay, so the first season is the only to consist of 13 episodes, the rest increasing to 26. And with the exception of two episodes being just downright silly, it's actually a great introduction to the series, and because this is the only season Hyman appears as executive producer, and I'll discuss why in a bit, I feel it most accurately represents the tone he envisioned for the show. It's truly Jet's pursuit of normalcy after leaving the celebrity life in Los Angeles, and while a few scenes from his show do exist in the episode, it's to depict him as the actor. Jed Jackson, not as the character, Silverstone. And I love that. So much. In fact, I was impressed by the show's ability to be a comedy, drama, action, and mystery all wrapped into one. But what sets this season apart from the rest is how the action mystery takes place outside of the show Silverstone, thus exploring what it means to be a hero while being grounded in reality. For example, the pilot opens up on a cool action scene on the Silverstone set, but then closes on Jet rescuing JB in an action scene of his own. In another episode, Jet and Wood get lost while camping after Wood gets injured, then Jet rescues the middle school bully from falling off a roof in another. And in the season finale, Jet rescues Kayla when she goes rock climbing with his stunt double Miles, who turns out to only really be brave when it's a scene being filmed for TV. These moments genuinely feel like the characters are in legit danger or distress because they take place off set, pushing Jet past acting like a hero and truly becoming one. On the flip side, one of my favorite episodes has Jet's superfan Delilah win a chance to follow him around. Now, Jet can't quite comprehend her obsession with him or his character, eventually reaching his boiling point and blowing up on her because Silverstone is just a show. But when JB shows Jet how his fans perceive him through his character on screen, he discovers how much it truly means to his viewers, then orchestrates this big pretend action scene to fix what he said to Delilah, again exploring what it means to be a hero. But I'm not Silverstone. I'm Jet Jackson. And Jet Jackson came here today to make things right. I guess I had one more trick up my sleeve after all. And that's what makes you Silverstone. There's not only solid character development here, but great relationship building and chemistry as well. I mean, something as simple as divorced parents getting along respectfully was incredibly impactful for 90s black youth. And just the way Jet interacts with his friends and family, it just feels so genuine and authentic. Now, let's talk about some logistical stuff. You may notice this character, Anna, just kinda disappears into oblivion after the pilot and another character, Kayla, is introduced with the same exact personality traits. Well, remember how I mentioned everything moved to Canada after filming the first episode? Yeah, so not everyone made the cut and got relocated. So the character was recast by a Canadian actress, which is, you guessed it, less expensive. And this isn't the only change budgetary restrictions cause because it's partially why Hyman left the production as well. While the show had a relatively low budget to begin with, the budget got even lower going into season two. And with budget cuts came staff cuts, one being Hyman's creative partner and executive producer, Liz Nealon. 
Disney also wanted Hyman to uproot his life and have him move up to Canada with no additional accommodations. Then, on top of that, the production wasn't always rainbows, butterflies, and puppy dog tails either. Hyman encountered a lot of pushback when it came to creative choices, selecting certain actors and crew, or making sure he accurately captured black culture. One instance even went as far as Disney rejecting Miss Coretta's line, I gotta get my hair did, because it wasn't grammatically correct. Now all this was going on while Nickelodeon was reaching out with a position for a show called Little Bill where Hyman would be head writer, have a lot more creative control, and they'd also work with him to relocate. So with that, he gracefully bowed out, retaining creator credit for the famous Judd Jackson, but going from executive producer to consulting producer, being replaced by Sean Levy. Now, when it comes to the show, it's clear Hyman wanted to focus on Jet, who he was, how he'd grow through his time in this small town, and how Silverstone was only a small part of his life. But, oh boy, did that change. For this assignment, I'm giving you Hawkins. What's a Hawkins? I'm Hawkins. You can call me Hawk. Get off me! Okay, so while season two brought in guest stars like Britney Spears, Regis and Kathy Lee, and Eartha Kitt, this by far is my least favorite and was actually a chore to get through. And although this season is a lot of fun, I'll admit, I do feel the tone drastically pivots and the show isn't quite sure what it wants to become under new leadership. The most significant change is the show leaning heavier into the Silverstone stuff and introducing two new characters. The first being Artemis, a mentor to Silverstone, but in reality a reclusive actor named Nigel Essex, and Hawk, a new overbearing partner, but in reality Riley Grant, a character I feel gets entirely too much screen time for someone who isn't a series regular, but let me rewind. The series leaning more into Silverstone isn't terrible. In fact, I think the color shift from the show back to reality is a really cool effect and exploring the Silverstone world gives the show this James Bond Batman feel and introduces us to some pretty awesome villains. The rat probably being my favorite because he adds this arch nemesis Joker vibe. Hope you enjoyed your little stay in paradise, Silverstone, because it's about to end. Get him! But here's the thing. <laughs> when the show devotes so much screen time to build out and develop these Silverstone stories, the stories that take place off set feel a bit rushed because they're trying to cram so many plots into a single 22 minute episode. For example, one episode dives into the relationship between Riley and her overbearing mother, explores Silverstone being left in charge while Artemis is out, and follows JB, Kayla, and Deputy Booker when Booker suspects this random dude is Elvis. I ended up not feeling invested in any of the storylines because they felt so disconnected and rushed, and that tends to happen very often this season. There's also an episode where Jet interacts with a ghost, so that kinda muddles the whole grounded in reality thing. Now, it isn't all bad though. Lee Thompson Young, who plays Jet, wrote an episode and it actually turned out to be my season favorite because it develops both Jet and Silverstone in parallel ways. And while the season starts off extremely rough, it does get better once it feels like the show is finding its footing. And as it comes to an end, there are quite a few heartfelt moments with Jet and his family, one involving JB and his dad, and another where Jet helps Kayla find courage to perform in an art show. Then the season finale finds Jet concerned with the show being cancelled, contemplating whether or not he should move back to LA. Those were all great, but also paced much better because it wasn't forcing several disjointed storylines. And look, if I'm being 100% honest here, <laughs> my biggest gripe with this whole season was the addition of Hawk slash Riley. Her introduction was just 
aggravating. They made her out to be a victim when she definitely overstepped. And quite frankly, Silverstone didn't need a partner. Jet didn't need a co-star and the show didn't need to add another character to develop when it already had plenty. In fact, if you removed her from the series entirely, it wouldn't change a damn thing. <laughs> Now, when it comes down to it, this season just no longer centers on Jet as a person. It becomes more about these wild situations he finds himself in as a result of being a celebrity, or some episodes simply don't center on him at all. And I don't mind the development of side characters. The first season does the same, and it does so wonderfully. It's when the show rushes that development, or spoon feeds the message to the audience, or anti climactically resolves the conflict that doesn't work. The maturity of the show just seemed to regress when it should have grown with the audience. But luckily, when it returns for its third and final season, it does successfully combine season one's storytelling and then season two's fun. 48, 49. Whoa, whoa. What happened at 50? Hi. Hey man, we were just checking the sturdiness of the two of you have way too much time on your hands. Listen, I don't know what memo got sent or who talked to who or what, but this season has much better dialogue, stronger, more coherent storytelling, more dynamic camera movement, interesting character development, and each episode actually has something to say without beating the message over your head. It's almost as if the creative team went back to season one, rediscovered what the show is actually about, then took that to improve on everything that didn't work in season two. First off, the Silverstone cutaways are still prevalent, but much more effective because they actively work to develop the character. They even explore Silverstone's backstory, revealing how Artemis raised him after his parents were tragically killed in an accident. They even take missions to more interesting set locations with sneaking into a ski resort, preventing an airplane hijacking, and then becoming Beyonce's bodyguard being the most memorable. Beyonce, wait a minute, I'm, I'm sorry, I I wasn't honest with you, it won't happen again. You're right. It won't. I don't want a bodyguard, and I don't need anyone looking out for me. Aside from that, it stated Lee Thompson Young studied martial arts in his spare time and requested doing more of his own stunts. So I feel that allowed the cinematography to become more action-y and energetic because they didn't have to work around stunt doubles. But this creativity extends beyond the Silverstone set, because even the scenes that take place in the real world seem more dynamic. And speaking of real world, this season addresses some significant real world themes and does so wonderfully. One episode begins with Jet trying to ruin his surprise birthday party, but ends on him becoming a bit saddened by the fact that his parents will never get back together. Another addresses ageism in the workplace with Ms. Coretta. One finds Jet falling in love and dealing with his first heartbreak. Another follows JB and his family while they adapt to a big chain retailer taking their business. One explores what it means to be multiracial with Kayla and her father. Another tests Jet and his mom's relationship when she directs an episode of his show. And one focuses on Jet and his dad when Jet finally beats him at a basketball game, forcing Wood to accept the fact that he's getting older. They even had my eyes watering when Deputy Booker is written off the show to pursue a detective career. Now, the realness doesn't stop there, though. There's also an episode that has Wood involved in a shootout and dealing with PTSD. Then another that involves bulimia when Riley's sister comes to visit. And yeah, they even fixed Riley. <laughs> it's like they learned how to effectively use her character because she's way less obnoxious and given much less screen time this season. I was actually shocked when I started rooting for her, y'all. Shocked! <laughs> Season 3 had me laughing, crying, joyful, and then even feeling a little bit sad when it came to an end. That said though, <laughs> the movie was uh... The movie was a bit of a step backward in my opinion. Now, this is gonna be brief because I intend on giving the movie a full review in its own separate video, but 
Jed Jackson the movie is fine, I guess. <laughs> Being the first Disney Channel original movie to be based on a Disney Channel original show, I didn't expect a Spielberg production, but I at least thought the storytelling would match that of season 3. But essentially the story is this, Jet gets off for three more seasons of Silverstone but is unsure if he wins that commitment and on the show, Silverstone is high key tired of being a secret agent and wants a normal life. And then due to some cockamamie accident on set, Jet and Silverstone end up switching places, antics ensuing. And I get it, the movie should be bigger than the show, and this is bigger. The stakes are higher, the special effects are better, the production design is stronger, but the movie just kind of feels like a season 2 storyline with a higher budget. In fact, I'm pretty sure the movie was written between season 2 and 3 because Booker appears in the movie, but he's still a deputy, which is confusing because just 3 months prior to the film airing, he guest starred on the show as a detective. And I know I'm nitpicking, but I guess I'm just a little disappointed because season 3 was such a return to form, more grounded in reality, and just so full of heart. While the movie just kind of falls flat emotionally and seems more like a gimmick than a proper send-off of the show. Especially because the series finale didn't really feel like a conclusion. But here's the thing. None of that is what stands out when I remember the show. Goodbye, Hollywood star. Hello, hometown mom. Uh, 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 uh. Now, the 90s didn't provide black kids with a great deal of superheroes. In fact, before Black Panther, Black Lightning, and Into the Spider-Verse, all we had was Blade, which was rated R, Spawn, which gave me nightmares, <laughs> Steel, which was a movie, <laughs> Blink Man, which I'm pretty sure wasn't targeted toward children, and then The Meteor Man, which I guess they tried. <laughs> so when Silverstone hit the scene, words cannot express how powerful it was seeing a hero that was not only black, but a black kid. Then to also follow him outside of his show within a show TV character was genius because he wasn't just this super spy, but an average kid who dealt with average things like bad grades, not making the cut for the football team, or being nervous about his first kiss. He also had flaws and made mistakes, but consistently learned and grew from them. What's more, the show depicted such a strong and healthy relationship between Jet and his father. They hugged, they communicated, they said I love you to one another, and turning the tables with Jet leaving his mother to live with his father full time was influential all on its own. Likewise, my parents divorced at a young age, and around 13 or 14 I made the conscious choice to fly across country to move in with my dad. So. I felt seen. There was also the introduction of a Jet Jackson comic series that appeared in a few issues of the Disney Adventure magazine in 1999, and that's just even more dope representation. Aside from that, there were also a few episodes that explored black culture explicitly. The episode that featured Eartha Kitt involves Jet investing in a baseball team that used to be in the Negro Leagues with mentions of James Thomas Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson, Buck Leonard, and Judy Johnson. And while that episode where Jet interacts with a ghost kinda broke the perception of realism, the story does center on Jet clearing the name of his great great grandfather who'd been accused of setting a church fire in 1925 when in reality he'd been the hero. It even briefly addresses how black newspapers used to be seen as less credible because they weren't written by white folks. Both were great storylines and highlights of season 2. But perhaps the best example of this takes place in season 3 where Jet's privilege is checked after he's accused of being too Hollywood to understand what it's like to be a black man in America. In order to prove something to himself, he refuses to take his limo home, loses his wallet, and then after a misunderstanding turned confrontation with the police, ends up in the backseat of a cop car. The storyline is handled beautifully, and I'll probably do my own separate deep dive into the episode because it's way ahead of its time, especially for a 90s kids show. 
Sad fact is, despite how far we've come in the last 40 years, a young black man living in the community is still far more likely to find himself in the back of a cop car than the back of a limo. Now, while this show had guest stars like Usher and Andy Lawrence, and you remember the Lawrence brothers? <laughs> they were literally like everywhere in the 90s, but a lot of the actors who went on to become pretty huge had roles on this show and it was kind of fun spotting them. Comment below if I miss any, but in season two, we get early appearances from Hayden Christensen, Brooke Nevin, and then both Ashmore brothers. Aaron showing up as a bully in episode 23, and Sean being in a dream sequence in 26. Then in season 3, we get Christopher Jacot as Riley's love interest, Megan Good appearing as the girl who breaks Jet's heart, and then Rachel McAdams who kills it as Riley's sister who struggles with bulimia. Seriously, so many familiar faces, but let's go ahead and go down the main cast list. While most are still in the industry, a couple quit acting entirely, and We'll start with those. While Carrie Duff, who played Kayla, had quite a few roles prior to Jet Jackson and a couple minor ones after, she's no longer acting or active on social media, so I couldn't find anything about her. For Ryan Summers' Bomb, who played JB, this appears to be their one and only acting credit, and most recent information points to them becoming a pastor. Gordon Green, who played Sheriff Wood Jackson, has continued his acting with roles as recent as 2022, but also directing his own miniseries you should definitely check out. Melanie Nichols King is still very active, appearing in shows like The Wire, Falling Water, and Filth City, again with roles as recent as 2022. Jeff Douglas, who played Cubby, stays active in television, having appeared on shows like Strange Days at Blake Holsey High and The Other Kingdom, along with Andrew Tarbit, who played Deputy Booker, who's appeared on shows like Infidels and Mobius. Nigel Sean Williams, who played Artemis, has had a lot of minor roles as recent as 2021, and Lindy Booth, who played Hawk, has been in a ton of television, her most notable roles being from October Road, The Philanthropist, and The Librarian. Now, sadly, Montrose Haggins, who played Ms. Coretta, passed away in 2012 at the age of 88, but had a long, steady career from 1986 to 2003, appearing in shows like Hanging with Mr. Cooper, Sister Sister, and The Parenthood. Finally, we have Jet Jackson himself, played by Lee Thompson Young. Now, the famous Jet Jackson was actually Lee's first television role, but you'd never know by his performance. He was charming, charismatic, super talented, and just an overall great person. For Caswell, Hyman actually saw him in a Robitussin commercial while they were casting for the show and immediately knew Lee was his jet. And ironically enough, Lee was also raised in a southern single parent household and began an acting career at a very young age. And after the show, Lee went on to have a very successful acting career with his most memorable roles being on Smallville, Flash Forward, and Rizzolian Isles. But now, here comes the sad part. In 2013, Lee Thompson Young tragically died by suicide. He'd been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, been taking medication, and suffered from depression prior to his death. This was a shocking and tremendously terrible loss. As someone who struggles with my own mental disorders, hearing this broke my heart. But got me to take my own mental health seriously and seek professional help. So if anything positive can be taken from the loss of this incredible performer, it's awareness. His family even went on to launch the Lee Thompson Young Foundation, which is an organization focused on removing the stigma behind mental health. So if you or anyone you know struggles with mental health, you can find resources here, and a link will be in the description below. Now, unfortunately, due to the show being produced by AAC Kids, a subdivision of a Canadian production company, the distribution rights sit with a company called Wild Brain. So Disney doesn't actually have the authority to stream it on Disney Plus, but hopefully that'll change one day because 
Disney owns everything else, right? But regardless, the famous Jed Jackson will forever hold a special place in my heart. And even though its tone and style significantly transformed over the series, it still shaped my preteen years, gave me a cool, positive role model, and taught me valuable lessons with its influence stretching far beyond the television screen. I do think a reboot could work today, and I'd be lying if I said it wouldn't be interesting to explore being famous but wanting a normal life in the digital age, but a reboot would have very big shoes to fill. So it takes someone who truly understood the essence of the show and could pay tribute to not only the original cast, but to Lee Thompson Young. In either case, I hope this video reignites a conversation about a show that so often gets forgotten because the famous Jed Jackson was a true gem and laid the groundwork for a lot of the Disney Channel original shows we see today. I want to thank you all for being here. I especially want to thank Mr. Jed Jackson. I'm making all this possible. All right, thank you so much for watching everyone. I really hope you enjoyed this trip back to revisit the famous Jed Jackson. And if you haven't done so already, check out my interview with the show's creator for Castle Hyman. It was an incredible conversation and I really think you'd enjoy it. It's linked somewhere on the screen. Aside from that, I have my retrospective for season three of Alex Mack, Taina, the Brothers Garcia, and So Weird all coming soon. I also have some bonus videos, including a deep dive into the Black History Month episode of The Journey of Alan Strange to celebrate Black History Month. So I'm super stoked about that too. In the meantime, feel free to stick around, you know, click some buttons and then check out the rest of my videos here. Go ahead and follow me on social and then don't forget to hit that thumbs up. It really helps me out. Then subscribe with a side of notification bell. Until next time, shine on you crazy diamonds.